I'm feeling lukewarm about our new Twitter fall tool. I might ask us to change, but anyway. There's, there's, I've yet to find a perfect Twitter fall tool. If you guys know of a really good one, let us know. Um, I think that we're all kind of here, so I think we should probably get started. Are you guys ready? Okay. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, you are uh, at the online community meetup and also co-branded this evening with the San Francisco Tech for Good meetup. Uh, and Regina, right over there, is the host of the Tech for Good meetup. Uh, I will talk a little bit about us and um, some interesting things that we're doing. Then I'll pass the mic to Regina. Then we'll um, do a couple job announcements. Uh, and then we will get started on the program. So uh, you are currently in the office of TechSoup. Does anybody know TechSoup? Oh, not a full house. Okay, good. Uh, so TechSoup is a San Francisco-based technology nonprofit that is global, and we have been around since 1987. There, you can see the back wall. Um, it's actually now would be the 27th anniversary, but no one seems to have changed that. But um, the history is that we uh, were started here in San Francisco around the corner, formerly called CompuMentor, and we used to uh, be an organization that connected nonprofits with tech volunteers, and we've evolved into this large global network of partners, and we ourselves are a nonprofit, and we help nonprofits with their technology solutions, meaning software, hardware, uh, a large community of experts, question and answer, blogging. We do all sorts of stuff. Uh, we are currently in like 67 countries. I'm looking back at Ariel, is that right? Yeah, uh, sounds right, yeah, ish, uh, give or take a couple. And um, and we uh, are, our mission is basically we're um, working toward a day where every nonprofit, NGO, library in the world has the technology that they need to fulfill their mission. That's what TechSoup does. Uh, I am with a new division of TechSoup, which is called Caravan Studios. Catherine, my coworker, I think is still here. Maybe she's not. Uh, she's also there. And we uh, are the newest division of TechSoup, and our focus is building stuff. So that's something TechSoup hasn't done before, where we're actually building apps for nonprofits. But we're not building apps for individual nonprofits. Instead, we're building solutions for kind of verticals, so mission-focused. Uh, we're finding out kind of ideas, problems that nonprofits have, and then grouping them and uh, building solutions, building apps to solve those problems. Uh, we currently have two in the marketplace and one about to launch. Uh, you can find us at caravanstudios.org. Follow us at, at caravanstudios. Um, I am at Suze Boop. I will ex um, introduce the rest of the team, but before um, the volunteer team. But before I do, I have an exciting announcement, which is timely because Not For Sale is an organization that helps to combat human trafficking. And today, uh, the Caravan Studios team, my team, won a very large grant. Uh, we were part of the Reimagine Opportunity Challenge, which is a privately, it's a private funded, uh, basically, a, a bunch of different people, Steven Spielberg's Righteous Persons Foundation and a bunch of other groups put together this large pot of m money administered by Humanity United um, to build tech solutions to help um, support survivors of human trafficking. And we applied, we we're one of 360 applications and we won. So we found out today, I know, it's amazing, we won, we, we won the prize. So um, that's pretty exciting. We're working with um, an organization called Polaris and the Polaris, um, uh, the Polaris Institute, they are basically uh, the hotline for human trafficking reporting. The 1-800 the number is them. So we're working with them and we'll be building an app to help uh, find, to f help fund shelter for human trafficking victims when there are no available shelter beds in hotel rooms and then get them on the road uh, out of, into a safe zone and help get them rehabilitated. So that's what the Safe Night app is. Our other two apps are Range and Four Bells. You can learn more about them at our website, caravanstudios.org. We're doing really cool stuff. I'm super excited about that team. Um, my my uh, history with this group is basically I launched this group to um, help community managers and social media managers um, connect and share best practices and uh, have a networking uh, on the ground meetup here in San Francisco. And I could not do that without the help of my incredible volunteer crew. So uh, can you guys stand up? There's Crystal who has a laptop on her lap, Dorothy, Susan, 
uh, Zach right here, who's shy and sitting down, red-haired guy in the front, Mia, Lewis, new member of TechSoup, community manager, uh, Ravi's in the front, he welcomed you. Uh, who else have we, do we have? Mark Siegel, Mark Siegel in the house, uh, other, other volunteers. Um, and our hashtag for this meetup is always OC Tribe. Uh, the other hashtag you can use if you want to, because this is a co-branded meetup tonight, is SFN2, which is the San Francisco Tech for Good group. Regina, do you want to say a little word about that? Then I'll do the job announcement piece. So hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out. And also, I found out tonight that Caravan Studios got that grant. So I just think that's awesome. So congratulations. Yay. And yeah, this is a co-branded meetup, um, SF Tech for Good, for those of you who have not heard about us. Basically, um, we are the first NetSquared group in the TechSoup universe of NetSquared groups. We are almost 2,700 strong. Um, we meet and have events around the intersection of technology and social good. And that can be nonprofit or for-profit. Um, a bunch of stuff is coming up. Um, we've got an event coming out on May 13th. Um, there is actually something planned for late June, and that speaker is here, but I'll, I'll hold that in. So um, be ready, and then um, we will see what's coming up. I've got um, talking to some nonprofits and other organizations um, for some late summer or fall events. And yeah, I think that's about it. Susan talked about TechSoup. Um, and actually, no, the other sponsor that we have is N10. Um, and they sponsor us and help us spread the word. So we're very lucky to have two great nonprofits that support SF Tech for Good. Okay. Thank, thank you. And uh, I wanted to also um, mention tonight's uh, snack sponsor, strawberry sponsor, chocolate chip cookie sponsor, and water sponsors, Instacart. And there is a secret promotion for the members of this group only. Uh, so I'm going to read you the bullet points. She was supposed to be here, but she's not. So um, I'm going to read it on her behalf. Instacart is a grocery delivery service that delivers in as little as an hour. We connect you with personal shoppers in your area who pick up and deliver your groceries from your favorite local stores. In San Francisco, we deliver from Rainbow Grocery, Costco, no membership necessary, Whole Foods, Safeway, and Foods Plus. To redeem $10 off your first Instacart order, get it. Get yourselves a pen or get your phones out. Write this down. Uh, plus a free delivery over $25. Did you hear that? To redeem your $10 off your first Instacart plus a free delivery over $25, use the code OCTRIBE at checkout. Get it. You guys should even tweet it. Um, so I, I wouldn't pass that up personally. So thank you for Instacart for sponsoring all those yummy snacks. And um, who has a position open? Who's hiring? Just one. Lewis, do you want to come to the front? Oh, two. Come, come to the front. Do you want to take a mic? Are you shy? No reason to be shy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lewis Height. Is this on? Um, the new senior online community manager at TechSoup. And we have a new opening for a part-time online community manager position. It's a role to manage our forums. It's an amazing opportunity. You get to make an impact. We're one of the only organizations. Our sole focus is on technology for social good. So check it out. It's going to be posted this week. Uh, it's been published today, and I'll tweet it. I'm Luisha. And, um, and the, uh, uh, his hash, his um, Twitter handle is L-E-W-I-S-H, L-E-W-I-S-H-A. Um, and by the way, everyone, all of the volunteer crew's Twitter handles are here. Um, so you guys can tweet at them and the hashtags, et cetera. Um, and the TechSoup Global job URL is TechSoupGlobal.org slash jobs. Hi, I'm Michelle Tai. I'm a community manager. Yeah, I know. We, this is the first time we've actually met in person. Uh, um, I'm Michelle Tai, and I'm a community manager at a nonprofit marketing agency called Media Cause. We're here in San Francisco on 2nd. Um, and we do search engine marketing, social media marketing, and email marketing for nonprofits. And we're currently hiring a search engine, search engine marketing specialist 
Um, so if you guys know, if you guys are familiar with Google Ad Grants and you're good at it, um, you should apply. Uh, and you have to be located in San Francisco or Boston. Uh, on mediacause.org, there's a button at the uh, at the bottom of the page. Just join our team. You can learn more about it there. Thanks. Does anyone have any other gigs to announce? Oh, sorry. So I'm Mark Siegel. Um, I'll tweet about this afterwards, but this is me. Um, so I've got a couple of positions. One's a writer position, sort of help and documentation sort of writing. Um, that's in San Francisco. And then I know two customer support positions, which are kind of like, you can think of it as entry level community management. Um, one's at my awesome company, we make software for businesses, and then one's at a game company. So I'll um, tweet about all those opportunities. There's seats up in the front, you guys. Don't be shy. Uh, okay, and anyone else have any other gigs to announce? Yes? Hi, I'm Jenny Graham Scott. I work with a couple of different companies that are looking for uh, a marketing person who um, could work on a commission basis. Uh, one is a company called The Publishing Connection, uh, which is just launching. It's basically a c uh, company that connects writers to publishers and agents and the uh, film industry uh, and also the media. It's been in existence for about 11 years. Um, I started it about 11 years ago, and it just got revived but with new partners. Um, I'm also looking for... Um, a marketing person for we're doing a campaign for a, com uh, a film called the suicide party which is uh, also a cause to um, introduce people to the conversation about inequality and also the economic suicide issue that's occurred and we're going into production in July we're looking for um, a marketing people who might bring additional funding for us we've had 25,000 to start with we'd like to raise that to 75,000 to bring in some a-list actors and then the third thing is I have a company called Changemakers Productions that does uh, low-budget films. This is the first of the films we're doing, and we have a number of other film projects uh, in the works. Um, they deal with social issues. So contact me after that if you're interested, and somebody who particularly is a, a good with the media and the social media. So find those people. Um, okay, show of hands. Anyone looking for work? Raise your hands high. All these people are very smart, and you should hire them all. So go find those people afterwards. Um, thank you. With that, I will bring you the Sarah Potts on Twitter of Not For Sale, which is at NFS. Uh, and she will be speaking about what the community of Not For Sale does and finding your community. So thank you guys. And um, in terms of Q&A, would you prefer to be interrupted? Or your, speak is, your talk's only 20 minutes, right? Yeah, hold or, or hold. For, wait, what do you think? What do you prefer? I prefer people interrupt. Okay. I'm, I'm a strong moderator. If anyone gets out of hand, I'll tackle them. Okay, that, sound, that sounds great. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And congratulations, third time, round of applause for that grant. That's incredible. <laughs> grant processes are so long and so undervalued in the process. <laughs> um, so I'm here. I'm from Not Free Sale. I've been with Not Free Sale for about a year and a half now. Um, I run. You want me to speak louder? Good. Okay, cool. Can you hear me now? Perfect, thank you. Um, I've been with Not For Sale for a year and a half. I manage all of our email marketing, our social media, our backend analytics, um, all of our design work and branding. So I have a really good understanding of what Not For Sale is trying to do and what we have been doing. So what I want to start talking about with you guys is just a little bit about finding your community. And I think to be able to find your community, you need to know about how we have found our community, because the best thing is not for me to share with you something prescriptive, but to give you an insight into how we've gone about this journey and this process. And you guys can glean from that what's important to you and ask questions, please, along the way. Um, so to start that, computer. Lovely. Not for sale. Not for sale is an anti-human trafficking organization. We've been around for seven years now. Human trafficking is an issue that affects almost 30 million people at the moment. Um, it, raise your hands. Who's familiar? Who feels familiar with human trafficking at the moment? That's great. That, that awareness alone is incredible. At Not For Sale, we believe that awareness is the first step towards engagement, and then engagement can lead to change in actions, and changes in actions can lead to changes in the world. So social media is incredibly important. All of our media, all of our communities are really important for doing that first step of awareness. Um, at Not For Sale, we have a lot of different projects that we do. Not For Sale works currently in four countries. We just launched a project in India, and 
very, very exciting. We haven't completely released this information yet, but since we're all here in a face-to-face -face community group, we are going to be starting our work in the Bay Area very, very soon. We're launching a project. We're working with lots of different community groups here, and that's going to take our work to a completely different communications level. Um, and so thinking through how we have been communicating and where we're going with our communications is important specifically for understanding how people can be involved in the prevention of human trafficking. Because Not For Sale wants to prevent human trafficking. We don't just want to rehabilitate or help survivors of human trafficking, but we want to stop it. And we think that we can stop it, but only if a lot of people are helping us. Um, another thing I want to focus on at this beginning as I'm giving you a broad understanding of what Not For Sale does is that we do on the ground, all kinds of work. A big issue we have in our communications is how many different types of engagements that we do with survivors as well as preventative work. In Thailand, we run a children's home. In Romania, we work with mostly adults, some child survivors of human trafficking. In Peru, we're working with 70, Peru's, the Peru team isn't here, so I think it's 77 <laughs> different communities. And we're working with them to create economic opportunities because there's no job market. And because there's no job market, they're selling themselves, they're selling each other, they're on one of the largest drug trafficking routes east-west of the continent. So there's so much vulnerability there that we're attacking that problem by creating systemic economic opportunities as opposed to providing shelter. Shelter is really important for children on the streets of Romania who've aged out of an orphanage and have nowhere to go. They need a place to stay. But an adult in the Netherlands who's been trafficked for sex for the past 15 years and is now 30, she doesn't need shelter in exactly the same way. She needs skills. She needs an ability to protect herself. So all of these different messages are really difficult to create simply. And that's just on our project side. We also find it incredibly important to engage communities. Communities, both on the local level as well as the corporate level. Um, companies have an incredible responsibility to act to protect individuals. We talk about sex trafficking a lot, but labor trafficking is just as big of an issue. And when companies don't understand where their supplies are coming from, if they understand that they need raw materials but aren't exactly sure where they're coming from, a lot of child labor, a lot of forced labor is happening. We just had the year anniversary of Bangladesh. I think that's an example we're all very familiar with about not understanding all of the implications of where our products come from. Having all of those disparate ideas and trying to engage companies and engage individuals and helping survivors in so many different ways, as well as working with athletes. Jeremy Affelt is one of our celebrity speakers. He has committed himself to fundraising for us through very specific and creative ways. And that's a completely different message stream. And it doesn't exactly have to do with human trafficking in the same way that volunteers want to know about or in the local community, but it's equally important to our ability to successfully prevent human trafficking. So deciding how we're, which messages we're going to tell is very important. Um, on top of that, it's important to understand that human trafficking is a very touchy subject, and that's with, I believe the stat is three out of four women are going to experience some sort of sexual assault in their lives, that the subject is not of sexual oppression is not something that's far away from individuals, that people understand violence in their daily lives. So how do we bring this topic that is so much worse than so many people have experienced, but still in line with experiences people can have because people understand violence, and bring it to them in a way that they would like to not hear about it once, not be educated at one event, but they want to be engaged with it. They want to be a part of it. Asking someone to be that close to something so painful for a long period of time is a very large ask, and it's a struggle that we deal with. So in community management, we must provide content that will engage our audience to take action and activate their community. Communities is where change happens. When we work with our communities on the ground, it's been a very wonderful experience to see the direct relationship that communities have all over the world. When we're working with communities in the Peruvian Amazon, initiatives have to be community-led. It's the exact same thing when we work with communities in the Bay Area of activists. It has to be community-led. We can't prescribe anything to any individual group at any time. People need to feel connected and empowered to the work and to the ideas that we're providing them. But when we're trying to figure out how to say, please listen to me, I'd like to tell you about the worst thing you've ever imagined. I'd like to tell you that human trafficking exists, modern day slavery exists. I'd like you to think about all the ways that you are personally implicated in that by the way that you buy your clothes, by the way that you eat your food, by the things that the electronics you buy and the coffee you drink, that all of those things have a responsibility and can be and most likely are tainted products. 
that is a very high barrier initial communication. Um, and we don't want that. We want to be able to empower people with this information so that they can take it to their communities and they can feel like they're the person at the party who has the answer. That they're the person who isn't going to sit and talk about how everything is broken. That in this city where there's so many conversations about what is broken, that they can talk about an answer. They can talk about a potential solution that they feel empowered by their relationship with us to not only fight human trafficking, but to share this information with their face-to-face -face communities. And this face-to-face -face community is where we see not for sales ability to empower individuals to improve their offline communities. Um, so just to recap, the, our content concerns, the problem is enormous. Human trafficking, 30 million people, that's a giant, giant number. How do you how do you talk about the content of slavery of 30 million people and engagement? And I'm asking you to tweet about something. I'm asking you to donate. And you're working so hard for your nonprofit and you're a volunteer and you give $25 and like bless your heart. And that's important and we need that. But how good does that feel when you know the number is 30 million? And then action is hard to quantify. What, do you, what feels important? What makes individuals feel like they're a part of the solution? Because they are, but without an equal response, without human trafficking is upsetting. Without an equal response that is positive, we lose people. And the cost of constantly seeking out and informing and educating new people is a huge cost to a nonprofit. It's not where we want to spend the most of our budget. We want to spend our budget informing and educating people on the ground who need the tools to get out of oppression, not to help people understand how to feel good about the work they're doing in their communities here. Thank you for that giggle. Uh, <laughs> um, so what we have learned, to engage with content about human trafficking, individuals must, be, must feel supported by their community. Like to break that down, because content, engagement, community, the three kind of pillars of this conversation. Um, content is that same thing we've been talking about. How does someone feel engaged with this content? What makes them want to not hear it once, but hear it twice, and then ideally share it with someone? And actions can be all different kinds of actions. Actions can be donating. Actions can be educating their friends. Actions can be taking this information and going to their HR department and saying, hey, do we have a matching donation problem or problem <laughs> process? Maybe it's a problem. They can also say, hey, what is our CSR? What's our corporate social responsibility here at my company doing? I I'm working for this company and I have my 401k, but what is my company doing to help the world? There are lots of ways that they can take these and bring them into the communities in which they already exist. You work for a large company, that company has a large impact. When companies make individual decisions, they affect huge numbers of people, and individuals who are employees of those companies have an ability to influence them, depending on your whether it's you tell your manager and you push for that to go up, or maybe you're in a decision-making power, which is also ideal. Um, so Not For Sales started, to give a recap of where we were and where we're going and why this sentence is really important for Not For Sale right now, is when we started seven years ago, we were a grassroots organization. We had a tour bus, and we were in churches, and we were shaking hands and kissing babies and like doing the thing, and it was great. <laughs> um, we, we had a wonderful time. We had incredible engagement. We had people who were emailing us all the time. We had people who, people who, someone tattooed not for sale on their bicep. Like, people were into it, and that was incredible. But the cost of running that tour and the cost of running that academy was so large, and a larger and larger percent of our budget was being put into engaging these fans who didn't want to engage with us online. They wanted to see us face to face, and that, and that matters. And the reason that matters is because to deal with a subject that is as emotionally frustrating as human trafficking, you need to feel supported. And we were being the support systems for people's ability to engage with the topic. So what we decided that we needed to do was step away from being that support system for individuals to be able to engage with this topic and instead provide them with the tools that they needed to be the support systems within their own community so that they could spread change and they could be the change so that they could take this message that we'd been working on and free up some of our budget so that we could go and do more work on the ground and open up a new project in India and open up this project in the Bay Area so that they can do more work and we can do more work. Um, that was hard. That was very, very, very hard. We had a community, we had a, like a different community leader in every state. We had yearly meetings. They had their own email accounts. They each had like Facebook pages of thousands of followers and telling them that we were not going to be visiting them anymore was very, very difficult, but it was a choice and I stand behind it because I think it is allowing us to be the company, not that makes us feel the best, but the company that does the best good. Um, and as we get into what platforms we have here, I want to talk about 
what platforms are allowing us to do what kind of good. So Twitter and Facebook are bolded because those are the ones that we use the prime, uh, most of our time and energy thinking about. When you're working for a nonprofit and you don't have a giant team, um, like my team is here tonight, it's three of us and we work real hard. <laughs> uh, and we do a ton of work and so we can't manage all of these platforms. Twitter, we identify primarily to create and capture moments. Twitter happens very, very quickly, just the platform itself lends itself to moments. Facebook succeeds much higher with our demographic with information that people can, that makes them feel like they've learned something. So very upworthy style information, things that you can read or look over and say, oh, I know one sentence more than I did beforehand. Whereas Twitter is much faster and people want to associate themselves with something as opposed to learn about something. Other platforms that we do engage on, um, Google Plus, we use that primarily because of its ability to increase um, SEO. When you search for us, we have the most recent posts that pops up. We use it for Google Hangouts, like all of those Google things are really great for just being able to communicate with people as a nonprofit and free service. Um, Instagram, we like using and we use when we can, but we don't try and cultivate that because it is so media heavy. Um, Charity Water, great organization, which a lot of you know, um, found photographer. So if you have a photographer and you're like founding members and you can create incredible photos, then like get on Instagram because people will respond to you very well. But we don't have, why we, we're not going to focus on spending the thousands of dollars it takes to get a high quality professional photographer around the world five times a year to take those photos. We're gonna share photos when staff go on visits and they're gonna be great and people are gonna love it, but our just to give you an idea, our Twitter following is about 50, and our Facebook is 60, and our Google Plus is 90, and our Instagram is 4,000. <laughs> um, YouTube, we also use primarily for fundraising campaigns as a place to put information, a place to put videos, uh, but not as a place to have daily engagement. Pinterest, we used when we did a lot of... Um, it's called, we had a store, we had a really cool store. And so we put together fashion collections that were all made by either slave free labor um, or individuals who were survivors from human trafficking. And so we were able to create this visual board about that. But because that is no longer part of what we're doing, um, it's no longer part of our marketing plan. Um, and then we also have put through a website and email on there because I think they're very important but slightly different than the rest of this topic. But I'm happy to talk to those if anyone has specific questions later. Um, so let's delve into a couple examples. Um, I have Twitter examples and Facebook examples. Here's the first one, um, trying to sh share some examples that work really well. This is associating yourself with inspiring content. Um, can you guys, yeah, you can kind of read that. The first one says, you must do the things you think you cannot do. Eleanor Roosevelt, be inspired, be the change, make an impact. The second one says, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world, and Frank. Both of these performed exceptionally well, um, different times of the year, almost a year apart. These did well because of an individual on Twitter's ability to see it, say, I feel so great about that, retweet it, and now be associated to everyone who follows them with this type of content. The things that are important about this are the time of day it was posted, the time of, while there are lots of um, you can sign up for a billion different email marketing chains that'll tell you the best time to post something and the worst time to post something and the rules about never posting at night. But it really doesn't matter what all of those rules say. It matters what your data says. It matters who pays attention to you because they don't, the person running Kiss Metrics like, is not interested in what not for sales community groups are interested in. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to your metrics and ours do really well between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. typically. Um, with exceptions around Sundays, people really like to talk about shopping. If we push anything around clothes on Sundays, I'm not sure why, but people will absolutely be interested in topical content on Sundays. Um, insights. Um, here's an example of another type of quote that fell short, but we thought it was going to do well. So this is, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Nelson Mandela, how are you changing the world today? So Nelson Mandela, we thought we were doing really well. Um, it's a great quote, it's about education. Lots of people associate with education already. But the problem was is that this wasn't at a time when Nelson Mandela was really relevant. There were lots of other things going on. If we had done this tweet when Nelson Mandela passed, it would have gone off the charts. But just because this tweet, this tweet didn't fail, this tweet did just fine. But understanding that your content is on Twitter is only going to be extremely successful if it is extremely pertinent to the moment. That you can be spending all of your time generating and working your butt off trying to create incredible tweets all the time. And I have found in our community it just doesn't matter. The most important thing you can do is be timely. That, that's it. There can be spelling errors. People don't care. People actually kind of find it in our community. People find it 
funny and they find it humble and they find it true and they, they see a person behind this organization. They just want to know that you're paying attention to the same things that they're paying attention to and that because they're friends with you, they will hear things before they hear it other places. Um, Twitter two, uh, make yourself a part of current events, which just leads right into this point. This is breaking news, all capitals catches your attention. USA Today just announced 150 arrested and 105 children rescued from a US prostitution ring. Um, something I'd like to point out about this current event is that we also spoke about it a lot of other ways. And this very specific content type worked really well for us. The breaking news and USA Today being the first thing got a lot of attention, added a lot of legitimacy, and just validated that what we were saying was already other places and that people could associate with their nonprofit. I think t people on Twitter in our community really want to feel good about being associated with us. And any time we give them something where they can show to their online communities that they're associated with something who's doing good, they want to do that. Um, the second one is another great reminder from SF Pelosi, do your part to make sure humans aren't bought and sold at the Super Bowl. Super Bowl super good time. Make sure to do that whenever people are online for whatever your community is and make sure that your community is interested in sports. Um, posting after the fact has a strong drop in engagement. Same kind of thing. Today is International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. We stand in unity with organizations worldwide to put an end to slavery together. It's a little wordy. It, it's the International Day of Slavery. How many people know about that? Not that many. We thought it was super cool, but our community didn't know about it. So it was much less successful. And then here, over 100 victims rescued in the largest human trafficking operation in the greater Houston area in years. Wasn't as interesting as the breaking news USA Today. Didn't have that same kind of um, gravitas as the first one did. So this is just posts that people are engaging with but really are not being spectacular. Um, this last one is about joining other community movements. Because we've stepped away from creating community moments on our own because we're having one-on-one -on -one relationships and asking individuals to retweet and to share. It's really important for us to identify times when the larger community is holding events and participate in those very strongly so that people can know that we are not leaving that community. It's just that we are not actively creating it, but we're still participating in it. And so that also puts us on a one-to-one -one relationship that not for sale is a person and like not for sale has a heart and is doing work as a human just like they are. And so people are much more interested in talking to us during those times. Um, Facebook, share the information that only you have. This is an infographic, the most vulnerable person in 2012. It's from our annual impact report about a year ago. Um, the great thing about this post is that this post was done does it say on here? No, March 7th, Th March 7th of this year. And this was created and posted and pushed everywhere a year and a half ago, everywhere. And we reposted it again being like, oh, isn't this a great highlight? People went crazy for it. On Facebook, as your audience grows, reposting information that was successful in the past will be successful again because people have new friends, because people want to be associated with it again. They probably don't even remember having seen this infographic before, even though we feel like this is an old infographic. Um, this also does a great job as a visual. Um, all of our Facebook posts do much better with images associated with them, even though you might look at all the Facebook rankings and Facebook, who knows how Facebook is ranking what on what day. But whatever they say, I would like to suggest that it, much, it matters much more what your community responds to and much less what Facebook is doing, especially in these community groups that are engaged with the content and not with a brand marketing strategy, like it's not Nike. Um, it's, it's a personal relationship that someone has chose to have with you. Um, and this image is great because you don't have to read the small text to understand the message. You can look at this, mes this image multiple times and get more information every time, and that's very powerful. Um, Here's another post that we thought was going to be great because it had a photo and it was new information internally, but we didn't make it feel new enough. Um, when we want to make this post feel new so that someone can take it, and we want them to share it on their wall so that other people will be interested in talking about it with them on their own wall. The conversation isn't going to happen on Not For Sales wall because we think that that interaction is really important, that support system they have with an offline friend. I share something and my best friend comments on it. That's a relationship. That's actionable. That's engagement. That can lead to change. It's very different than me asking for someone to share their opinion about human trafficking publicly on Not For Sales wall for everyone to see. It kind of lets them have a little bit of privacy, a little bit of space, a little bit of support. So we thought that was going to happen with this post, and it happened 0%. Um, <laughs> no one saw this post, um, we think, because it just wasn't interesting enough. It didn't, it was vague. It, well, we're talking about structural oppressions and the need for jobs. It, it just wasn't 
fun or interesting. It's great information, but just not, not social worthy, if that makes sense. There are other platforms where this would have done much, much better. Um, here's a powerful moment, again, kind of the current event types of things. This post, we were really excited about doing so well because it tapped us into current events and common knowledge. So it was talking about a woman whose daughter was sold in Mexico. And people, and it's an intersection of drug violence as well as corrupt government as well as human trafficking. So they're like little like trifecta of people who are interested in this. And people already know a lot about Mexico. And it, it feels close, it feels knowable. It helps a lot to know that as opposed to children in Thailand. Um, finding things that people, that your community probably already knows about and asserting yourself into a, that conversation and being very close to it increases your ability to reach more people because you're going to find people who are not only interested in your topic, but in this other topic that you're close to. Um, then bring clarity. This is another post that was very interesting by Human Rights Watch, but we kind of tossed it up there for an alley-oop and no one gave it a slam dunk. Um, we wanted to say, this is very interesting, everyone go read this, but we didn't tell them why it was interesting before they were going to read it. Um, everyone in the office read it, but no one outside of the office read it. <laughs> so it just needs to always remember to captivate first. Even if you feel like you have a lot of engaged fans, like captivate every time. Uh, we find it helps to change the person who is managing some of your social media because it gets very tiring to be that happy and that excited all the time. Um, it's important that that person have, whoever is trained so that your brand voice is consistent, but managing social media for an organization or multiple organizations is exhausting in your need for exuberance. Yeah, question. Oh, that's a great question. Um, we use a couple different things for looking at data. Um, we look at, on for Facebook, we primarily look at Facebook Insights. So on the top of the Facebook admin page, you can click on Insights, so then you can select your data range and you can identify, do you want to look at reach or visits or posts, and you can identify the specific subcategory of information you're looking for. Uh, I'd be happy to show it to you as well. Um, and then for Twitter, we use Twitter Analytics. Um, we're actually working with Twitter trying to figure out how to improve analytics for Twitter. Um, they're asking some just like very kind questions to nonprofits being like, hey, do nonprofits use Twitter? I was like, yes, Twitter, we do. <laughs> um, and so we use Crowdbooster. We also use Twitter analytics. But what we're trying to figure out, um, this is great. I'll just jump all into numbers right now. Um, numbers are important and measuring what your goals are is important. On Facebook, your reach isn't necessarily the thing that you want to be measuring. For us, what we're the most excited about is not the number of shares on a post and the traditional idea is that like a like is good but a share is better and comments, depending on who you are, are the best because it shows the engagement higher than a share. We don't need to have high comments on our posts at Not For Sale. We don't need to have high likes or really high shares. What we really need to see is that when someone does share our content, that their community is talking about it. And you can see that right here. So shares and then or comments on post and then comments on shares. So there are four two comments on the post on the not for sale side, but then there were four on the shares from there. So let me, let me go up because that didn't make me feel the best. Um, there we go. So that went 10 times more. So if we had 21 comments on the not for sale page, when people took that information and they shared it, then there were 201 comments on the shared posts. So that conversation blew up by like 10 times once it left our page. And so we don't need to be greedy with that information. I don't need to feel like all of the fun has to happen at my house. As long as I'm pushing out information that other people can use and they're interested in it, then that is good. And you have to whoever, if you're managing social media or if you're the social media manager, please be open to this from your social media a community organizer like you have to push this information up and really understand what is the what is the journey what is the experience of someone using a Facebook platform or your, your Twitter platform or whichever platform it is that you decide is your most salient option and say what is the best moment a person could have with me here and then what numbers do you want to define that um, we also like Crowdbooster and not for sale it gives really good uh, visual displays of information um, Sprout is also very good if you're interested in paying a little bit of money for it. Crowdbooster you can get for like $10 a month. I can give you all my plugs for social media management afterwards if you like. Where are we? Measure and adapt. <laughs> Work with followers to achieve your goals. Figure out what your goals are and then figure out how your 
followers can help you achieve those goals. And it's a, it's a push and a pull. What do you need them to do to achieve your goal? All of us, if you're here, tech for good. Not for sale, we're trying to end human trafficking. We need people to care. We need people to act. We need people to engage. And we need to be very clear about what our goals are for all of these social platforms. And then we need to create ways for people to enjoy helping us achieve those goals. Our basic operating procedure is to get people to want to share this information to the people with whom they have face-to-face -face relationships with so that they can have an ongoing conversation that is positive and that is informed and that can inform purchasing decisions and donation decisions throughout their lives. Um, here's some photos of what Crowdbooster looks like and the way that they can show information. And this is to show how our reach has changed over time. Back in the day, you see that all the way over on the left. Um, I don't think you can see the scales right now. It's 60,000 on the left side. And over here on the right side, it's 240,000. So while these graphs look very similar, the scale is quite different. Um, and by really t doing the very painful thing of stepping away from community groups who we had very close, wonderful face-to-face -face relationships with, we've been able to really tailor our messaging to platforms that have the response that we need to be as flexible as we need to be to be able to have the impact we want while still maintaining relationships that are important for the people who are engaged with us. Um, final thoughts before any questions. Are, know what you want to say. Choose the platform that best fits your goals and learn what your community values so you can provide it to them and then empower those individuals to own your mission because when they feel a part of it, they'll be very happy to share it with their family and their friends and their community. Um, thank you so much. And do you guys have any questions? Yes, perfect. Question. Hi. Thank you. Claps in front. <laughs> Money, money, money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I can hand off the mic for the next question. Repeat. Yeah. So for our six-person online audience. Um, the, <laughs> um, the question was, if we're talking about social media, how do we value social media as a fundraising tool? Um, and the answer is sporadic and not very well. Um, <laughs> So we run a couple, so I think my favorite thing is just measuring, ev measure everything, say I think this could work, measure where you are when you start that, expect your goals and then see what happens. Um, we did for our year in giving, which is for us November through December, it's a high donation time period because people have money and taxes and things and love in their hearts. Um, and we asked people to donate. We did a whole metric around if everyone on Facebook, you know, our 60,000 people donated X number of dollars right now, we would reach our $1 million goal this afternoon. Like, so can you donate? I think it was $19. If everyone on Facebook who likes us gave us $19, we're done today and we can all like have a great holiday season. Um, and we, the way we ended up targeting that because also the data collection on the back end can be difficult depending on what you're, how you're able to follow that journey and what kind of security you have on your actual donation platform. Um, but if you're doing that by specific dollar amount, if you do, we call them giving handles, a specific giving handle for different audiences where you geo-target and you say like, hey, everyone in San Francisco, give me $20. Hey, everyone in New York, give me $30. And you start to see different donation amounts coming through. You can start to attribute that to different online marketing attempts. Um, like correlation is not complete causation, like, but we're not data scientists and we're doing the best we can. Um, so that is something that we have done has worked really, really well. We saw our first, we were the first time ever we were able to attribute social media engagement to donations this past year and that was very exciting. What I like to use social media for when I'm talking with our development team is that in the donor cycle is that you have you want to meet someone, you want to impress someone, you want to ask them for something and then you want to thank them and then you want to do that again and that's your donor cycle trying to keep people engaged instead of like meeting someone and asking them for money and then asking them for money and then asking them for money and that social media is a really great way to have someone just constantly doing the like meet, impress, thank portion of that, and then trying to get those people off of social media and by doing information drives and trying to say like, do you want to learn more about, in our case, India? Sign up for our India mailing list. 
And we try and get them on email marketing because our ability to understand who they are on email is much higher than our ability to understand who they are on social media just because of platform issues. Um, so that's what I would, that's what I try and do. I try and do things to get people onto our email list where I can segment them in lots of different ways um, and then have a donation ask, but only do minimal social media donation asks because that's not what that platform was made for. Um, and I would do it only if you have something timely because if you wanted to donate to something on Facebook and there was some information that you could glean from it, if you're like, oh wow, I had no idea about this thing. But so many people are so well informed right now, like everyone in this room knows about human trafficking. So how would you find something completely new that you could teach them about that they would feel so excited about they would donate? Or on Twitter, there's a hurricane in Thailand and we have a project in Thailand and I need money like right now. Um, I think that would be very successful, but only in those large scale news events would I suggest a large scale social financial push. Does that answer your questions? Cool. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's see if I can reiterate that question. So at the nonprofit you work at, your donor triangle has been focused on high asset donors and you're trying to prove the value of social media to adding to that style to your bosses, correct? Cool. Um, I would say the places that I've seen it work. So our, our CEO is like charismatic boss man. Like he's traveling around the world, like sitting at like the Swedish King's castle. Like he's like doing things that are cool. Like 100%. We have like Bruce Willis boss. And I think that what we end up seeing is that when he is out and about, he, he will like take a photo of him fishing with a potential partner. And he'll be like, awesome time at the boat with Mr. Barleen. And, and like, and then he, he tweets that, and then me, at Not For Sale, I say, sounds like great things are happening, and then they feel like things have already happened when they haven't happened, and it's just on social media, but their social media manager knew about it. So now what you've done is you've created, yeah, right? <laughs> so you've created a conversation that that company already knows about Not For Sale. So when you come in, you're like, well, I don't know if we want to work with this nonprofit. Like, can we trust them? Like, we're a big company. Yeah, who knows? But when your staff is already talking about it, and they're already seen the Facebook page, and they've already seen what we are, and they've already had a conversation with us, then they feel great about it. So they just feel good, and then it's just up to our sales team to close the deal, which is their job, so they're good at it. Um, so that's one way, and I think that's really important. Um, I think another way is to just drive general awareness. Um, you never know. It's like increasing those like inbound leads. Like You just don't know who's out there. And you have an ability for a small number of dollars to increase the people who know your name and your brand and your logo that you cannot do with traditional marketing with a limited budget getting people just to know your name and starting to even like on social media you can be so pushy like you can like if you wanted to just like hang out with Nike you could just like be talking to Nike like all day like, <laughs> and you can and, like and people will talk to you and like big brands and big companies that have the money to have extensive social media networks they want to engage with people who are engaged with them and so the more people see your name associated with another name is also really great um, I think it'll be slow and I think that you should I think that's something that could probably happen with a part-time person or with a like three-month setup trial. I think you could figure out what is happening and set a couple like milestones. Like I think that we could increase by 10% over three months and meet that goal. And I would set them very like finite and specific goals for them, because if social media is something that they don't know anything about, community management that they don't know anything about. They're going to be like, well, where are my million dollars? And you're like, well, it's not really the goal of this. So you have to be really clear about what you think your goals are. And if you want to talk more about specifically what they could be, I'd be happy to talk about that afterwards. Oh, yeah.
That is so hard. Oh, the question. Um, the question was, um, you work for a nonprofit that does, no, you work for a for-profit that does marketing, and you have nonprofit clients, and you're trying to use your social network to help boost them, but the change in message is complicated. And how do you have two different messages living side by side? Um, so one of the things that, not let's see if this anecdote helps. Um, one of the things that Not For Sale does is we engage different brands, um, emerging brands mostly, and people who are trying to already have socially responsible ideas. Um, Alter Eco, Square Bar, delicious. It's a plug, but it's also delicious. Um, Bull and Branch is a new company that's making really wonderful sheet sets. They're like very, very soft. Um, <laughs> and and so, we have, so we have these things, and we want to talk about them because they're giving money back to Not For Sale, which is us, and then we're going to give that money to survivors, and we're going to use that for our operations. Like, how do I plug, like, or like a Dodo case? This is the good, a good example. Dodo case. Is anyone familiar with Dodo case? Three people. So Dodo case is lovely. It's a great case for your like iPad Air. So after you spend all of your thousands of dollars on your Mac, you can spend another hundred dollars on like a fancy case for it. Um, and that's a really specific demographic. And it is not our community demographic. However, Dodo case was really, really happy about partnering with us, and they were just like devastated that we didn't want to market about. They were just, they were like, they, they were emotionally upset that I would not tweet about them more. And I had to sit them down and be like, look, there are only certain times when me talking about you is good for you. If I talk about you at a time when my audience isn't interested, it, it doesn't help you. It actually only hurts me. Um, so what I try and do is I try and create baselines for what my community wants and our, my community is my most important community and I don't know if you want to start growing your community to include other facets but if you have a community that you that you like and you want to keep them then I would create baseline understandings of what is average and then I would say I would start posting about other things and other interests and as soon as you see those numbers start to dip say nope like people aren't, people aren't responding. I need to stop talking about that and talk about the thing that my community comes here for. And then I can start talking about this other thing. Um, and then the best way to talk about that other thing is to be really clear in the message about why they would care. Like if they come to you because you're a brand marketing expert and people follow you on Twitter because you always show like the coolest like new dye line awards, um, then you should find something cool to say about the branding of a nonprofit that you're working with. Even if it's not, even if what they do is like rescue kittens, but they have a really cool logo, you should say, look at this sweet logo. Even though that's not what they want you to say about them, that's what your audience will be interested in, and that is their entry point into that message. So it's making sure that you really, really super control the messaging that your community is interested in, and don't let other people's feelings get in the way of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the question is, do we still have six people watching? <laughs> oh, and you, in the future. Okay, cool. Um, the question was, <laughs> um, the question was, how do we deal with the cognitive dissonance of offering beautiful high-end luxury bedding while also fighting the world's worst oppression? Um, and it's hard. It's, uh, uh, so the people laughing behind you are my coworkers. Um, it's hard. It's very, very hard, and we fight about it. Um, and I think that's healthy. I think that we should fight about it. I think that there is no reason... This is what I came down to personally. I think there's like a moral decision that happens. And my decision was, if you give me $5 and I thank you from the center and bottom of my heart and I say that means something to me, then if a company gives me $5, I also say thank you for that. So my messaging to my consumers isn't going to be about how bold, like, like any of these specific companies are the world's best company. But when they do buy that thing, and if they're going to buy that thing anyway, 
why not let them buy that thing and help me? And by helping me, we're helping the world be a better place. That I have struggled a lot with the idea of like, let's just like tear down the system. Let's like capitalism. There's a lot of flaws, guys. Like, let's think about it. <laughs> um, but we're not we're not doing that. We're not going that way. And the people who need to help us are the people who are succeeding in this system. And they're they have companies and they're doing really well. But they're not. They just don't understand. I find that there's cognitive distance. People don't understand. Um, and so our sales team is really wonderful at having those conversations. And our sales teams will go out and they'll promise things and they'll say things and they'll get the deal. And then we have different people on the team coming in and like be the enforcers about like what we will actually do. Um, it's not a perfect process, but I think it is very worth having because it has opened up the number of dollar dollar bills that we have and that has increased our impact and i truly believe that for our specific cause is if that we if we have uh, i don't know safeway change a sourcing practice for their coconuts that matters radically and just because i'm not going to see it that's something that i should know better than anyone else they like that csr decision matters tangibly and i need to f and then my job as a communicator is to explain why that decision should make people feel just as good as the new like shelter house that is helping survivors we also need to help prevent this so that it's kind of long-winded <laughs> you have a question Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So the question was, we have an app and it's called Free to Work. Um, Free to Work was also a project that was funded um, and co worked, co created, um, funded by the State Department and worked with um, ILRF to create an app. And what this app did was you can scan a barcode, and that barcode would then produce some information on your smartphone that would say, congratulations, you would like to buy Doc Martens. They have a B. And so you can decide in that exact moment, do I want to purchase this? And what that did is it would power in the moment of shopping because a lot of shopping is done on whims. And that's great. I like that about shopping. But we needed to find a way to empower that really actual act of shopping. Um, and those grades were all done through a research grant that went and we looked at the risk, the, li the likelihood of slavery in supply chains. And we didn't have the money to go like with our like binoculars on the ground, um, but we think that human trafficking is systemic. And so if companies are able to talk to us about what their supply chains look like, we should be able to know by looking at their supply chain how likely it is like that forced labor will be in their supply chain. Are you getting all of your cotton from Uzbekistan, which is like 80% of the world's cotton and also like one of the world's worst human rights violators in the whole world. And like, eh, I don't really want to work with you. Like that's, that's a really high likelihood that there are children who made this and died making this. Um, that app was awesome. Except for the fact that the app didn't work very well, the concept was awesome. <laughs> um, the reports you can find online, we have one that we just launched for coffee and there's an apparel report and you can read about it and feel super informed and people love it. And people love it because of all of the information that we put in people's hands in the form of a report as well as in the form of like a moment to moment app. Um, the difficulty with that is funding. The difficulty with that is how do you get someone to front the money to research into companies about how they're involved in slavery. It's very like wagging your finger at the man and the man doesn't like it and the man doesn't want to fund it. Um, so while it's, it's created wonderful communities and we have a lot of people who are engaged with us because of that and we continue to provide, um, just release that coffee report and the apparel report, it's a project that we are having a hard time continuing with just because of funding reasons and because of organizational structures. We think that there should be an organization that just does that. And there are cool organizations that are trying to do that. Um, um, what's that one? Abala Shop was, um, yeah, Abala Shop was uh, an organization, an orga a, a dude, a guy, um, <laughs> who took our data and then created an app that would be a plugin, essentially the same thing as the barcode scanning, but for online purchases. So you could like put it on your Amazon.com account, and when you drop in and you say, like, I'd like to buy my new computer and my three new Twilight DVDs and these slippers, it would say, great, all of those have an A. And you're like, oh, cool, I feel so great about that. Or it would say, hey, all of those have an F, would you like to put those back in the store? And you could say yes in that moment. Um, that's not up and running yet, but that's an idea that stemmed off of the research we'd done. So it's something that really engaged people because of the tool, but that we need more funding and more people to go and make that more usable across more platforms. Maybe that's you guys, I don't know. 
Let's talk about it. Oh, great. Um, what's the best way to get involved not for sale outside of donations? Um, tell all your friends about it. Um, really, it, it's, it's about sharing the message and bringing it up that I'll, not everyone, un, everyone for the most part understands that sex trafficking is an issue. Labor trafficking is a huge issue. Where our clothes come from, where our shoes come from, where our coffee comes from, where our electronics come from, that's, it's hard to learn about, but doing due, gil due diligence there and trying to make everyday decisions that make the world a better place really do make the world a better place um, and creating a community of people who support those actions so that you have a positive feedback loop and you're not alone in trying to make the world feel better because that's too big of a task. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Great. I just made a connection online community. Um, anyone else? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, I think that right now the majority of our work is trying to raise funds for our Bay Area project, which we're going to be launching soon. We haven't talked about that completely all across all media yet. We'll be launching that within the next six weeks, I think. And that's going to be a huge community push. I'm actually, I'm very excited because all of our work has been international thus far. The, like, the community engagement opportunities have been around understanding problems internationally. But now we have the opportunity to educate our community about what's happening in our community and bring it home to a completely different level. So right now I want everyone on my email list so I can tell you about my thoughts as I have them. So you can sign up for that at notforsalecampaign.org. Join. Um, and that way you can stay in the loop about what we need when we need it. Uh, we're trying to be very, very flexible about what we need and people, people caring and people sharing what they want to know about so they'll feel connected will empower us to provide that content so that, because we need, we need them, we need people to care um, and be with us. Um, I saw a question in the back. So the question was how much money are we trying to raise, but I didn't hear for which part. For the Bay Area Project, gosh, hard-hitting questions. Um, all of the money, um, I think. <laughs> I think the goal. Please don't quote me on the Twitter about this. Is a million for that. Um, what is cool about that is not for sales model is to provide jobs, um, provide skills training for individuals who have been exploited or who are survivors of human trafficking so that they can be integrated with a job that is not only going to provide basic necessities but allow them to survive. A big issue with human trafficking, a little less in our community but internationally, is that even if a woman is being controlled by a pimp and she is getting a 15th of her the money that she is owed for her work that is still a higher amount of money than she could be making working nine to five at the local bakery so even if she works longer hours and like manages to get away from all the violence she's making radically less money and then where is she going to live with less money and it, it's very complicated so we're trying to simultaneously provide job skills and this is this is why i love this part of my job is because we're providing these job skills to people who need them and then also we're working with companies to understand how they can build internships and jobs for this demographic because if we just give skills and there's no job there's no progress so working with companies to say you this matters and you need to provide these jobs and this area is so full of potential and entrepreneurship and, and jobs and work and money. And so we have um, an invention hub, which is down in the dog patch on 20th and 3rd that we just opened. is about to be completely open to the public, but not quite yet. And you can get coffee there, and it's real good. Um, and there we're going to be training people as well as training companies, as well as creating new ideas, as well as having incubated new entrepreneurial companies in there. We have an accelerator called Numi who works with um, at-risk or minority groups who are entrepreneurs and want to start businesses. So we're trying to do a bunch of different things in the Bay Area simultaneously because we have all of the resources in one spot. So million dollars, if you have it, would be great. <coughs> um, in the back, yeah. Are we working with the San Francisco Collaboration for Human Trafficking? Is that yes? Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, okay, online community. We're currently talking about local community things and being connected. And I'm not running that project, so thankfully someone else is doing that work. Um, and our, our manager for that project is has spent almost a year doing research and working in the area and figuring out and connecting. And I haven't been completely involved with that. I haven't been given the whole debrief on it. But we're working with lots of community partners because there's a lot of good work already happening in the area. So we want to know what our successes already, what are pitfalls already, what are things that groups already need. And we'll be working with a group based out of Oakland called Missy. Um, and they're a wonderful group. Um, and I think we've had a long relationship with them. So that'll be our first partnership in the Bay Area. What about who? Um, I don't know about Sage, but again, it's possible that my coworker does, and I'm just underinformed. Okay, off topic. Okay, on topic. Anyone? I saw a hand. Yeah. Um, the question was about Kickstarter or Indiegogo for fundraising. Um, I'm out on a very thin limb thinking before my time at the company, and I think yes, but that would have been years ago. Um, we've really built up a community that we ask for most of our fundraising from. Um, we used to do some fundraising on causes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. They have a lot of different community engagement platforms. Um, we ran an incredible campaign with them, and it worked really well because it was really it was a really specific campaign that worked really well for their platform. But for the most part, we find that focusing on the platforms that we already engage on, we already are creating content with those platforms and those user experiences in mind. And so creating new content for a new platform, for a new experience can just drain our resources, even if there's a higher potential for donations. But then there's like a higher cost for us to create it. And then are we duplicating content um, and effort? So we have shied away from that and instead are focusing our fundraising more on creating a sponsorship team as well as focusing on how to create more high asset individual donors who just like have money to burn. <laughs> cool. Well, if that's it, then thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to talk to all of you tonight. So uh, thank you all for coming, and um, thank you, Regina, for co-hosting and co-producing and writing the Storyfy, which she's going to share using the tag. Uh, don't worry. That's amazing and fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zach, for uh, live streaming, as usual. Uh, we will have an archived version on the, live, on the Ustream page on the YouTube channel. That's right, uh, which is search for what? Just search for OC Tribe on YouTube and it's archived if you want to see it. Uh, we have Baby Center um, in July. Is that right? Not June. Are you guys doing July or June? June? Next month. There we go. What? Either way? Okay, June. Let's say June. <laughs> I thought it was. So um, we have uh, the Baby Center community managers right there speaking, or community directors and um, product manager. Uh, speaking about the baby center community, and it's huge. If you guys don't know, you're not breeders. You don't don't really care about babies, whatever. Uh, the baby center community is enormous and well known for really being great with managing a very broad, vast community. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have them speak next month. They will be here. Uh, their office is actually across the street, so that's convenient for them too. Uh, and then the following month, uh, we have Katie Kobe, and then we have some other stuff. I'm going to be putting together a panel um, probably in August. Of um, And if anybody's interested in this, ping me. I'm at Sue's Boop, you can, um, or just email me, Susan at Caravan Studios. The panel's topic um, is going to be uh, personal brand, managing a personal brand for your community, creating a community around yourself and what that means. Um, that crystal, that girl crystal, is part of that panel, and there's a few others. So um, thank you very much, and uh, have a good evening. And I guess we have some time. You can chat here for 20, 25 minutes, then be on your way. Thanks.